I have to remember it's a new year, you know, particularly like when you go to sign your checks or when you say, hey, welcome to my shop. It's 2017. No, not anymore. But welcome to my shop. It's January 6, 2018. At least welcome to the outside of my shop. It's a little chilly outside here. Not too bad. But I wanted to get this car outside so you could hear it run. You know, I've had a bunch of successes this past week. Most of them were little, but I had one which I would consider quite major, which I'm very happy about. But a couple things right off the bat. Take a look at my air filter housing on old Fritz here. This is my 1980 280SE Euro model. I don't know if you remember in all those earlier videos, it, it was all rusty and flaking and chipped. And you, you know how I feel about detailing. So I had to take care of that. It, who cares how good the engine runs as long as this air filter housing is pretty. The other thing I had to do, by the way, is I had to fix this rear view mirror here. You know, when I got the car, I couldn't even adjust this. I literally could not even move it. So I took it off this past week and completely lubed it up. And now it's just, oh, it's so nice. You just turn the knob freely and smoothly. You can adjust it from one extreme to the other. So later on in this video, I'll kind of show you how I lubricated that mirror there. And then also I was able to fix that annoying exhaust leak in old Fritz here. Now, granted, this is kind of like a temporary repair, although sometimes my temporary repairs <laughs> go for a long time. So I'm going to show you how I did this. But when I start this thing up, you're going to notice a difference right away. Can you tell? Okay, I'll get back here by the exhaust. See how nice that sounds? Also, look at how well the engine's running. I mean, I got to admit, there's still some things I've got to do to this engine. I think I've got a little issue with the warm-up regulator. But right now, it's running pretty sweet compared to when I drove the car home. Listen to this little six-cylinder run-up. Pretty smooth. So what I'm going to do today, since, you know, this is really kind of my play car, is I'm going to get this thing in on the lift, and we're going to go after this thing for a full service. That's engine oil, transmission fluid, rear end fluid, brake fluid, brake hoses, and all those things that probably haven't been changed in quite a while. So I'm kind of out here right now warming this up so I can pull it inside to drain the oil. I also got an issue with the oil pan. I'm going to show you that once we get it up on the lift. I want to show you this just before I paint it. You can see how I use a sandpaper to smooth all these chips and the paint out. Now, you could strip this if you wanted to do it to show quality, but I'm not interested in taking that time. I, you know, this is just a driver, but I want it to look nice. So I cleaned this all up, and as a final prep, I went ahead and cleaned it one more time using very clean, warm water with a little bit of Dawn dishwashing liquid to get that final kind of film of grease and dirt off. But one final thing before you paint it is use a tack cloth. These tack cloths are included in my detail paint kits. So you just want to rub lightly. Don't rub real hard, but you're just rubbing lightly over the whole area. Do it about two or three times to make sure you get all the dust off before you go ahead and put the primer down. Here you can clearly see the patch that I put on the muffler. And this thing is hard. I mean, it is really tough. You know, I put three layers of glass cloth on there, and it was a little tricky to get this to stick. I didn't have to use wax paper. I didn't have to use any kind of tape to keep this up. But using a procedure I outline in my instructions that come with our Miracle Paint, I demonstrate how to get this patch on and keep it stuck to the muffler. <laughs> it's pretty tricky, but this thing is amazing. Now, I've had these on mufflers 10 years. <laughs> and, you know, I always say, well, this is a temporary patch, and it ends up being kind of a semi-permanent patch, particularly if the rest of the muffler is in good shape. These mufflers on these gasoline cars tend to rust out right down in here. Look at the picture before I put the patch on, and you get a hole in there, and they just make a terrible burbling noise, like you heard when I first got this car. But uh, I'm not going to worry about the muffler for until I probably finish restoring the car. So I'm really happy about the repair on this, and I'm really happy about the sound. 
Now I should point out, don't expect this to stay on catalytic converters, they get too hot. Any forward muffler or any pipe next to the exhaust manifold is just too hot. So this works best on center mufflers and rear mufflers and possibly rear pipes if you've got small holes in them. When it comes to lubrication, this is another part that really gets neglected. It's these outside rear view mirrors on these older Mercedes Benzes. Look at this one off of W126. When you try to move it, you can hardly adjust the mirror. So it gets very difficult to adjust the mirror while you're driving. Well, take a look at the amount of pivot points in this. You have a ball socket here. You have another ball socket right there. You have a pivot point there, a pivot point there, a pivot point there, and one right in there. These get as dry as can be. Now, if you just try to put some grease on these, it isn't going to really work because you need something that will penetrate down in these ball sockets and penetrate down inside these riveted joints. So the grease of choice for me is the thick, real thick synthetic, uh, this is 100% synthetic grease. And I really believe that synthetic grease is the only thing that's going to hold up inside these mirrors because these are subject to moisture and even water under extreme driving conditions. And you can see already there's quite a change in how easy this moves. Now to really exercise this thing, I need to get it back on the car. But before I couldn't even turn this without excessive force back and forth like this. So I'm going to go ahead and mount this back up on the car and then I'll probably exercise it some more and it'll really be nice to adjust. And if you should need information on how to remove your mirrors from your car, I do have some videos available on my website on how to get these mirrors on and off safely without breaking pieces. You can see I've got Fritz up on the left and we're ready to do a major service. Start on it today, Saturday, but I doubt whether I'm going to get it all finished. I'm gonna focus on the engine oil, transmission fluid, and the brake system, including a complete brake fluid flush. But, uh, you know, I spent some time earlier this week just checking out the transmission and sure enough, the shift bushing was totally shot. So look at me straining to get that front shift bushing on. I mean, that was tough. If I hadn't had that special tool, I would have never been able to install that front shift bushing right over here. But it's really nice now. When you shift it, there's no rattling or slop. But when I was looking at the car, I saw this right away. And this does cause me a little concern. You know, I don't know if this has gone in far enough where it's Damage the oil pickup, but that's a pretty bad dent. Somebody hit this pretty hard, probably some sort of parking curb. I went ahead and ordered a new pan in, a new pan gasket, and when we drain the oil, we're going to start on this first. From this angle here, you can see how bad that dent is. So you can see why I'm concerned that it's far enough back it may have damaged the oil pump pickup. So that's a real concern. So this pan is coming off, but sure enough, I went to drain the oil. And I see this so often, the oil drain plug is rounded out. Now, I would recommend if you just get an old Benz and you're going to be your first oil change, you get under there and make sure this bolt is good condition. We do sell replacement bolts. In fact, we sell one that has a magnetic pickup, and that's the one I'm going to put in Fritz after I replace the pan. But if you're just going to get rid of the bolt and get a new one, best way to get it off is to get a pair of vice grips. Yeah, it's already damaged, okay? Man, that's on there tight. So we'll just grab that with good old vice grips. I think the problem is a lot of people use open-end wrenches trying to get these pan plugs out. Always use a, you know, a socket, preferably even a six-point socket if you have it. Okay, here comes the oil. Now, when I pull the oil plug, look at how I hold my hand up. I don't put it down here. I hold it up like this because it's going to come roaring out of there and then I tip the bolt. Make sure you set this back away so it picks up the oil. Since I don't have any history on the engine, I don't know when the oil was last changed. And I'm going to put my favorite high mileage engine oil in this thing and I'll do a separate video on that probably next week. Before I dump the oil out of this pan, I want to show you this. This is really Interesting, look at that. I drained that completely out. This is why I like to use a fluid extractor when I'm pulling the oil out of an engine because most engines, when you pull the pan plug, it doesn't get all the oil out. 
This should be an eye opener to some of you who haven't seen a pan off an engine before, particularly on a car that, you know, this one is 37 years old. And of course it's had oil changes. I don't see any metal in here, but look at the sludge in here. Look at all that sludge. So this might be a good reason when you get one of these old cars like this, go ahead and pull the pan and clean it out and inspect it for any kind of engine particles. This is a real good inspection on an old engine to see how well it's doing. But I'm happy not to find a lot of metal particles in here, but it's a good thing we're replacing this pan. Let me show you. It's not only just to clean the sludge out, but man, it really came close to that oil pump housing. Okay, take a look at how far back that damage is. Now we're gonna lower the pan down and we'll take a look at the pump. And you can see how close that pump is and you can actually see scoring marks. It looks like that damage came within, let's say less than a quarter of an inch of cracking and damaging that oil pump. You know, I'm looking up at the clock and it's getting kind of late in the afternoon. And sure enough, like most Saturdays, uh, I'm not getting everything done that was on my list. <laughs> you know, we ran into some real problems pulling this pan off because we found some other issues that we had to deal with. And of course, I didn't have the parts, so I couldn't put the pan back on. Now, when we went to the transmission, that was great. I don't even think I needed to drain the fluid. It was so clean. So I think that service had been recently done. But once again, I do it anyway. Even if the fluid looks clean, you're not even sure whether the previous person put the right fluid in or maybe the mechanic you know, didn't do that and you're not sure how long it's been sitting because even though the fluid may be clean, if it's too old, that's not good either. Now, you know, just this past hour, I started pulling the brakes apart. We have a whole bunch of brake issues. So I'm sitting there cranking out all these videos. I'm thinking, man, this episode is going to be an hour and a half long. And I don't think most people are going to sit there and watch Saturday at Kent's shop for an hour and a half. So what I've done is I've broken out these other jobs as separate videos. Like the other problems with the pan and the transmission. And I'm going to do that with the brakes and I'm going to do that with the rear end. So I think in the future, this will become the modus operandi of the Saturday episodes. It'll be kind of an overview. I won't go into the details, just like you saw with the muffler patch, and just like you saw with the rear view mirror. I'm going to do extended videos on those, and I will post them as separate videos probably over the next week or two. So if you're watching this video, you know, a month from when it was produced, I'll probably have some links in the show more part of the description below sending you to the, the other videos which will explain some of the things we've been doing in more detail. Now it looks like because of the issues with the brakes, take a look at this rotor. Any of you want to guess what that rotor is telling me? <laughs> and I've seen that probably on two or three of the rotors and on a couple of the calipers. I've got some real stories I can tell because the brakes are talking to me. They're telling me things that I can share with you to prevent problems with your own brakes. So I think I'm going to do a series, a whole series on brakes. Not so much how to replace the pads or how to fix them because there's all kinds of videos on YouTube on how to replace brakes and rotors. What I'm going to do is focus on things that may help you troubleshoot certain problems, just like right here. What is this rotor telling us right here? <laughs> And that's going to be covered in that break series. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of wrap it up. I want to show you my tool of the week right now. And then I'm going to go over on the bench and kind of uh, answer a bunch of questions that people constantly are asking me. You can see I'm under old Fritz here. Guess what I'm doing? That's right. I'm cleaning off the residue of that pan gasket. You know, we've got to replace the pan on this engine. And one of the best tools to use for this is a plastic razor blade. You do not want to scratch the aluminum on this upper pan section, but there's a super plastic razor blade out there. Most of them are small like this. This is what you get most of the time when you get plastic razor blades. But this is the one that I like. You know, it's the same size here, but it's wider and it's much stiffer. So when you go to scrape, really hard gaskets. This super plastic razor blade does the job. This is my favorite tool of the week. <laughs> you 
You know, I went back to check that scene and I go, oops. <laughs> You're probably thinking, yeah, hey, what's the cork board for? And he, well, I think now you found my secret. This is my focusing prop. That's correct. This is what I put in the location where my head's going to be so that I can focus the camera and film myself. Now, that's my secret of the week. You know, I have to tell you, last night, Jerson and I were having a lot of fun. In fact, we stayed till about 6.30 because once we get on the idea, uh, oh, we need to create a new tool or we need to solve a problem, then we go to town and sometimes we forget about what time it is. And that's what we were working on <laughs> last night. This is gonna be our new special tool. Now, this is kind of the evolution of a special tool, but this is the prototype. And I'm gonna tell you next week whether or not we're successful. Now, also this week, I was having a problem with another issue, electrical issue, and I thought, man, there's another new tool I need to develop. But you know what I do now is I actually go online and do a really thorough search to make sure somebody else hasn't already done it because I don't need to reinvent the wheel. And sometimes that happens. There's some other really creative people out there. When we find a tool that solves a problem, we know exactly what's going on. Somebody's like totally frustrated with not being able to get the job done, find the tool to do the job, and they invent their own tool. Well, this is the tool that arrived this past week, and I am really impressed with this tool right here. So in next Saturday's episode, I'm gonna demonstrate and show you what this thing can do here. And, but now for those questions. I think some of you think, oh boy, Kent's gonna answer technical questions. <laughs> no, I'm gonna answer kind of some non-technical special interest questions. The first one I'm gonna answer is concerning this. I've had a couple people ask me, well, Kent, what, what is that airplane up there? You know, and one person, is that an albatross? No, this is a Grumman Goose. And this was a plane, an amphibian that was produced during the World War II era and used in a lot of areas for transportation, you know, all the way up probably into the early 70s. When I was fishing in Alaska in the Juneau area in the mid 1960s, Alaska Coastal Ellis Airlines was using the Grumman Goose in and out of Juneau as one of their mainstay transports. And I never got the chance to fly a Grumman Goose, but in 1969, man, that's almost 50 years ago, I got to fly a Grumman Widgeon. Now the Grumman Widgeon is the baby brother of the Goose. And I tell you, that was probably the most romantic and most exciting airplane I have ever flown. You know, you can sit there and you got the throttle quadrant overhead, you know, and you're taxiing out and you got waves breaking over the bow, you know. It's a lot different than flying a normal seaplane, which of course I have quite a few hours in. And so there it is. That is a Grumman Goose. The other question people ask me, they say, well, Kent, what kind of watch do you have? <laughs> They're obviously seeing the watch in the video. This is a Skagen watch with a carbon fiber face. But unfortunately, they don't make it anymore. I actually bought two of them because I liked it so much, and I'm on my second one. But I like this watch because it's super thin. I don't want to be snagging a watch on some component when I'm working under the car. The other reason I like Skagen watches is they have like super tough crystals. You know, I banged this into some things and it's never scratched. So, you know, that's my watch of choice. The other thing people ask is, well, Kent, where do you get these gloves? Or what, what are those gloves you wear? Why green? Okay, well, we sell these gloves on my website because they're kind of hard to find. 
And one of the reasons I wear gloves, people have made jokes about that. It's like, Kit, do you have any hands? <laughs> well, the reason I wear gloves, believe it or not, is if you put your hands, if you move your hands into a video scene, it can really mess with the exposure of the camera if you're on automatic mode. So what happens is by using these darker gloves, I can control that exposure. I wear these gloves because the best I found, they're tough. They have a lining which helps you breathe and your hands don't get all sweaty. So these are my gloves of choice because they're such good gloves. And then finally, people always ask me about the shop coat. Hey, Kent, <laughs> where do you get the shop coat? Well, they're kind of hard to find too. So we sell these shop coats on my website. I know it sounds like I'm trying to sell stuff, but people ask if you want the gloves, you want the shop coat, I'll put a link below in the description of this video. If you want the watch, you'll probably have to find one on eBay. So that wraps it up for this Saturday. I want to wish all of you safe motoring until we meet again.